Good evening. Thank you for coming out in this freezing rain. I'm just gonna turn this microphone down a little bit. Is the volume okay? Yeah. All right, great. Welcome to New Canaan Library. My name is Kayla and I see some familiar faces in the room. I'm a digital services librarian here. And I'm super excited to welcome Mr. Shamal Idris to the library tonight, who's going to be lecturing on preventing war and securing peace in the 21st century. We're excited to hear what you have to say. Um, to tell you a little bit about Shamal, he is the chief executive officer of the Search for Common Ground, the world's largest dedicated peace building organization. In his current capacity as CEO and in his previous capacities as president, Chief Operating Officer and Burundi County Director, Shamal has led efforts to end violent conflict in more than 35 countries globally, including some of the most devastating conflict zones in the Middle East and Africa. Among his many accomplishments, Shamal was appointed in 2005 by the UN Secretary General Kofi Annan as Deputy Director of the UN Alliance of Civilizations. In this role, he supported high-level political and religious leaders in developing policy recommendations and action plans to improve cross-cultural relations between Western and Muslim-majority countries before, during, and after the Arab Spring Revolutions. We expect tonight's lecture to run about 45 minutes to an hour, and then we might have some time for questions at the end. So please join me in welcoming Shamal. Uh, thanks, I see some friendly faces as well. Uh, thank you for braving the ice storm to come out here. Uh, before I get started, uh, I'm gonna ask you all to close your eyes, if you could. And uh, I'm going to, you too. And um, I'm going to say a word and I want you to remember the first thought that comes to your mind when I say that word. Then you're either gonna write it down on a piece of paper or in your mobile phone, whatever it might be, okay? So remember the first, and don't be nice, don't edit, don't try to say something you think I'll like. The word is peace building. So write down whatever word came to mind or thought came to your mind. You can tap it into your phone. We'll come back to that in a few minutes. So as Kayla said, I did grow up here in New Canaan, Connecticut. Um, uh, my mother, who's here, was born in Turkey and my father in Syria. And like a lot of immigrants, they did everything they could to get my older brother and myself to the best education system that they could find, and that was here in, in New Canaan. Um, I grew up across a lot of cultural, religious differences. When we were growing up, we were the only Muslim family that I knew in town, um, though we were very warmly embraced here. We used to go every summer to visit my mother's extended family in what was then fairly rural Turkey. Um, pretty much everyone living together in one big compound and everyone in each other's business. Um, they didn't have a lot of money, um, very different from the kind of affluence here in, in New Canaan generally. My first summer jobs were with the Public Interest Research Group, the PERGS, Ralph Nader's group, that's sort of going door to door and getting signatures and, and money and sometimes doors slammed in my face for environmental causes. And the culture in the PERGS, those summers were, uh, was very young, hugely anti-corporate. Corporations were the enemy. And uh, the parents of some of my closest friends here in New Canaan were executives in some of the biggest corporations in the world. Um, and then I ended up going to Swarthmore College just outside Philadelphia. Uh, very politically liberal, liberal arts college. Um, uh, it was founded originally by the Quakers. Quakers are very big into peace building themselves. I got trained outside of my classes in mediation, how to facilitate dialogue, and I really took to it. And so growing up, I think looking back now, I was crisscrossing a lot of different sort of religious, cultural, political lines, and, and I had you know, deep friendships and even people I loved across all of those lines. So it made it very difficult for me to see people or issues in pure black and white terms, that all the good is over there and all the bad is over there. Today, as Kyla was mentioning, I'm the CEO of Search for Common Ground. So uh, we have um, more than 750 full-time employees and, and thousands more volunteers and partners working in offices in 28 countries around the world, uh, including places like Myanmar and Iraq <coughs> and Central African Republic and Nigeria. And what I wanna talk to you about tonight is uh, what we've gleaned and what we understand from dealing with the front lines of violent conflict around the world. Uh, there are three major insights that have become crystal clear to me from my work at the UN to my work now with Search for Common Ground. Um, the first is that conflict is inevitable, but that violence is not. 
Okay, so say that again, that conflict is inevitable. It's a natural existence of difference. It's a natural friction that happens when people come up against each other across religious, ideological, political, other lines, right? Conflict is absolutely inevitable in a diverse world, but violence is not. The number two insight is that this issue of whether we can deal with conflict, whether we have the ability and the political will to deal with our differences well, is the number one issue that holds back progress on everything else. I would say that if you're concerned about climate change, if you're concerned about nuclear nonproliferation, if you're concerned with how do we prevent the spread of pandemic disease, if you're concerned with pretty much any one of the major issues today, the hallmark of those issues today is that they require, in order to be addressed, they require a level of cooperation across countries, across cultures, across public and private sector um, that is almost unprecedented. You know. So that's the second insight, right? Um, and as an organization, Search for Common Ground believes that we can actually address conflict in constructive and nonviolent ways. And the third insight is that, let me get it. Um, oh yeah, that right now, if you look at where our kids are growing up today, we're really living at a historic inflection point between one way that the world came about to prevent violent conflict and generate cooperation and a new approach, which hasn't yet emerged. Um, so what I want to do tonight is uh, take you through a, maybe sort of a 30,000 foot level look at what's going on in the world around conflict and peace building down to sort of a community level approach, what works back up to the 30,000 foot level. I want to start with a quick poll of the room. So if I were to ask you, we're now, we're just days away from 2020, right? So we're almost 20 years into the 21st century. If I were to ask you right now, let's say we could fast forward 80 years to the beginning of the next century, to 2100, okay? If we fast forwarded, let's pretend, let's be optimistic. We're all alive and well. Um, I'm sure some of us will be. Um, um, but uh, let's fast forward those 80 years. Do you think, and I'm only going to give you two choices, okay? You, you, we're not going to debate them. Do you think we will be looking back at that point on what has been the most peaceful century in history or the most violent century in history? And you don't get to pick anything but those two. So if I forced you to pick one of those two, if you fast forward 80 years and we're looking back at this century that started in 2000 and will end in 2100, do you think we will have lived through the most peaceful century in human history or the most violent century in human history? Let me ask first for the hands. I think it's probably going to be the most peaceful. Wow. Okay. Uh, those who didn't raise their hands, who think it's going to be m the most violent. Right. So let me ask first a couple of those who said they thought it would be the most peaceful. Uh, why, why do you think that? So we're coming out of what, and, you're, and you think that trend line is likely to continue that, that, that reduction in conflict since those two world wars, that, that trend line will continue. Yeah. Uh, anyone else who thought it was going to be the most peaceful had a different insight as to why? Yes? Let me take one more from the most peaceful. Well, let's not count it as violence. Let's say people's lives, if we're looking at that. So here's technology, but you know, we're both more connected than we've ever been through technology, and maybe technology through technology will be able to prevent wars that kill people. There's one more hand up, and then I want to switch to the violent, the folks who think it's more violent. Yeah. but mutually assured destruction keeps us from going that, down that path. Right. How about, um, I'd like a couple hands again on the ones who said that it's more likely to be the most violent. Right here, Mitch. Yeah. Mm 
and sort of scarcity and climate change. Yes, sir. And you think that we won't be able to use technology to solve these problems? Right. Sounds good. All right. Um, so let me talk you through kind of where we've gone uh, over the last 70 years on this question of violence. And um, if you look at what happened from 1950 until the turn of the century, until 2000, so you take right after World War II until the turn of the century, um, it's already been referenced uh, that we saw levels of violence as measured by number of people killed, both in aggregate and per capita, so adjusting for population growth. You saw the levels of violence, people killed from violent conflict, drop from 1950 until the turn of the century pretty precipitously, not completely steadily, but precipitously to by far the lowest levels in recorded history. Okay? So we, that absolutely did happen. That was already referenced before by a, a couple people who hope maybe that trend will continue. And what we've seen with that liberal world order that was established after World War II is a few main elements. The first was that a whole multilateral system was set up, right? If you look at the Charter of the UN, in the very first words of the Charter of the UN, the purpose for the UN was to prevent another war between the great powers and to foster common cause on common problems. So the whole idea was, okay, let's try to not have another one of those world wars. Let's establish this venue at the UN where member states will come and will negotiate out. And the, the basic idea was based on one central principle, which is state sovereignty. We can all sit here. Let's pretend we're each of us is a, a representative of a member state, right? We each get invited because we're a recognized member state, so that's your ticket to get in. And once you're in, we agree that I'm not going to violate your borders, you're not going to violate mine, and on that basis, we'll try to work everything else out. So the UN was set up on that basis. The European Union on the European continent, which launched those first those two world wars, the African Union, NATO, even tactical things like the hotline that was established between Moscow and Washington, D.C. to prevent a nuclear holocaust. All of these efforts were put in place after World War II to try to prevent violent conflict and to foster cooperation on shared problems. Um, largely because of the effectiveness of those systems, what we saw over that period of time from 1950 until the turn of this century is an explosion in well-being on pretty much every single front. You see historic and unprecedented levels of poverty reduction, eradication of disease, uh, economic productivity, uh, spread of democracy and liberty. Uh, in 1945, according to the Kellogg found Foundation, there were 12 democracies. In, 19, in 2000, there were 87, and in 2018, there were 100. Um, if you look at economic productivity and economic well-being, every single region of the world, every single one had dropped in poverty levels, substantial drops in poverty levels, and increases in economic productivity. So what you saw from 1950 until the turn of the century is a historic drop in the levels of violent conflict, the lowest levels in recorded history, and with that drop, an explosion in pretty much every other measure of well-being. However, if you look at where we are today, we're now living at a 25-year high in levels of violent conflict. So that trend line that was really you know, plummeting until the turn of this century, we're starting to see tick up again. What's going on? So on the one hand, there are really two things going on. One is that that system that was set up after World War II had within it the seeds of its own failure. Yes, it was set up in order to prevent war and foster cooperation, but it was also set up to protect and advance the interests of the winners of World War II. I mean, if you look at the one place within the UN that has real political power, the UN Security Council, the five permanent members of the UN Security Council are the winners of World War II and the major nuclear powers. Um, uh, those, uh, you don't have any representation from the entire continents of Africa or South America, huge population centers in the world. Um, uh, and so it's not that surprising that you have countries wanting to pursue nuclear weapons and asking the question, why do those guys get to have it and we don't get to have it, et cetera, et cetera, right? You also see that if you look at the, six, the top six arms producers in the world, the top six arms producers in the world include all five of the permanent Security Council members plus Germany. Most of the arms that are being deployed and, and, and uh, used come from those countries, but the devastation that's wrought by them is not tending to happen in those countries. So you have a system that itself has got some inconsistencies and some hypocrisy sort of built into it. And then, of course, all of that economic well-being that we talked about that I referenced 
that exploded, but at the pretty devastating cost of environmental health and well-being. And we're seeing the, the impacts of that today. So there's some elements of the system, as good as it was, as well as it worked out, that are, had the seeds of its own destruction within it, um, right? But there's a second layer that's going on in the world today, which is the nature of violent conflict has really changed. So if you look at the last 20 years, you look at the turn of the century, there are two forms of violent conflict uh, that we've seen proliferating that don't really get very affected one way or the other by that whole multilateral system that was set up, right? So the first is collapsing states. Rwanda in 1994 with the genocide, Syria over the last decade, Venezuela today. When we see a state collapse into civil war, or you see a leader start to turn the military on their own people, like in Syria or in Rwanda, that system that we set up where we each get to represent our nation states and we're going to cooperate really struggles to deal with that. For people who are really interested in this, there's a whole debate called the responsibility, the, the responsibility to protect. At what point, and this is a debate in the UN, it's been going on for many years, at what point does state sovereignty, which is, again, the whole principle, the number one principle of this whole system we set up, at what point does state sovereignty give way to humanitarian need? At what point do we say, I don't care that he said he doesn't want us to come into his country, we can see that he's killing his own people and we have a responsibility to protect those people we're going to go in. And that responsibility to protect doctrine, that's never been applied with any consistency. Again, you go back to who gets to draw the rules, uh, the interventions that happen in other countries tend to happen at the behest and the interests of certain countries and not of, of others, right? So the first problem is these collapsing states and what to do about them. And when a state collapses, it not only devastates the lives of all the people in that country, but it tends to destabilize uh, entire regions. I would say the Syrian conflict alone has completely destabilized um, not only the Middle East region, but has affected politics all across Western Europe with the refugee flows and, and the response to it. The second form of conflict that's really proliferated over the last 20 years are transnational violent groups, right? non-state actors. Whether these are religiously inspired extremist or terrorist groups, uh, whether it's the ISIS or Al-Qaeda or the Buddhist or Hindu extremist groups across South and Southeast Asia, um, or whether it's the identity-based groups, the white supremacist groups that have inspired attacks internationally from Oslo to Christchurch, New Zealand, to El Paso, Texas, who are literally referencing one another's manifestos, you know, or it's even the gangs and the cartels. So if you look at the southern border of this country and the debate over the refugee crisis on the southern border of the United States, more than 90% of the people coming to the southern border of this country and seeking asylum come from one of three countries, El Salvador, Guatemala, or Honduras, right? More than 90% of them are coming from those three countries alone. All of Latin America makes up less than 9% of the global population all of Latin America. But Latin America also accounts for more than 30% of global homicides. And those three countries in particular have ranked in the top 10 of homicide rates globally for the last several, many years. Um, and basically what's happening is that the drug cartels and the gangs are directly threatening the ability of those states to secure the number one thing that you're supposed to secure for your citizens is safety, right? When your police have to wear masks so that their families don't get targeted if you tend to be you know, pictured on television or whatever, you know you're really struggling. So what we see happening with that international system that, that worked so well in many ways, other than environmental protection, but worked so well in many ways after 1950, after World War II, is that it's unable to deal with collapsing states, and it really struggles to deal with these transnational movements, right? The Sinaloa cartel, the white supremacist Hammerskin Nation, ISIS, none of these groups have a seat at the UN. Right? They don't play by those rules. Uh, my head of programming in Nigeria was talking to the Nigerian National Security Advisor. And Nigeria is a very important country. One out of five Africans is Nigerian. There were more babies born in Nigeria than all of Western Europe last year. Uh, it's a hub for the, the sub-Saharan African uh, media industry, major natural resources. So the, the uh, National Security Advisor was saying to our head of programs, he said, look, I'm a military man. When Boko Haram, the extremist group, when they attack in the northeast of the country, I have a button I know how to push. I can send in the military. And I know that I'll get short-term stability. But I also know that everything they do to get that stability today will feed the next recruitment drive tomorrow. So I, and he literally said, I need more buttons to push. And this is something that we're hearing out of military leaders, national security advisors, political leaders, community leaders, that the old tools prevent, pre for preventing violent conflict are no longer sufficient. Uh, I was talking to Chuck Hagel, who used to be the Secretary of Defense here, and before that a Republican senator, and he said to me, look, the U.S. has not won a war in decades. 
And it's not because we don't have the strongest military. We have the strongest military in human history. It's that the kinds of fights that we're getting into now cannot be won through military approaches alone, or even through primarily military approaches. So if you look now at what's happening in the world at that 30,000 foot level, there's pretty much universal recognition that the old system needs revising. Um, we are living at a time now where we have uh, a historic refugee crisis. There's 70 million refugees, more than at any point since World War II. The vast majority of them are coming from conflict zones. If you gave a dollar today to a humanitarian organization, 80% of that, 80 cents on that dollar, would have to go to victims of violent conflict. Just a decade ago, 80 cents of that dollar would have gone to victims of, human, of uh, environmental uh, uh, disasters. Um, and that's violent conflict. The World Bank puts out a report every year looking at what are the causes of poverty and suffering in the world. They used to name a number of different causes. Starting in 2016 and each year since then, they've revised their findings to say violent conflict is now clearly the primary cause of poverty and suffering in the world. So we really need to figure out, and there's pretty much universal recognition that we have to figure out how we can better prevent violent conflict. What works? So that's at that 30,000 foot level. And what clearly doesn't work anymore is purely state-to-state -state action. Just as warfare is being perpetrated by non-state actors, so does peace building have to be perpetrated both at the state level and at the citizen level, right? So we don't have time tonight to go through the full methodology of my organization, but I'm gonna share with you, and this is where we're gonna come down to the, the community level, what actually works, what's been proven to work to prevent violent conflict in, in conflict settings, right? And I'll share with you basically three steps. Uh, the first, when we enter any conflict zone and throughout our engagement in a community in conflict, uh, our first is gonna sound the softest, right? It's to look for and invest in signs of hope. Somebody once said that hope is not a strategy and I agree with that. But what you find when you're engaging in conflict, whether you're trying to improve relations between the Chicago police and youth groups in Chicago, or you're dealing with conflict in Yemen. Um, if you start from a perspective of looking at what are the problems, trying to rank everything that's going wrong and tackle the biggest problems, that's a recipe really for cynicism and paralysis because there's so many problems, right? You have to look for signs of hope. Uh, has anyone here ever heard of the term appreciative inquiry? I came across, I ask here because they're, I'm sure they're successful business people. I, I first came across uh, the term in a Harvard Business Review article that had nothing to do with peace and conflict. The article was about how do you change the culture in your company and it said that the worst way, what appreciative inquiry basically says, is a very well-researched field, the worst way to change behavior is to punish bad behavior. All you parents out there, I'm sure you're listening to that. The worst way to change behavior is to punish bad behavior. The best way to change behavior is to identify, incentivize, celebrate, amplify every step towards the desired behavior, no matter how incremental it is. And there have been all kinds of funny experiments done with this. There's a, uh, a study done um, on a campus where all the students who were sitting in the class wanted to get the professor to move away from the podium. And so whenever she'd stand behind the podium, they would look down, look forward or whatever. Whenever she stepped out, they'd look up and perk up. And then they'd go back again. And by the end of this two hour lecture, she was all the way on the other side of the stage. In, in, and I know this with my own kids. If I yell at my older daughter for not putting her shoes in the bin that I got for that specific purpose for the 50th time, it's a lot less effective than if I praise her to the moon because she put one shoe in today. She's much more likely to put two in tomorrow. And I'm not saying that punishment never works in any settings, but the basic idea of appreciative inquiry of this well-researched field is that the best way that you change systems or change behavior is to incentivize and reward and amplify every step towards the desired behavior. So even if you're going into a community in conflict and a lot is going wrong, you look for what's going right and you amplify it. What does that look like? When we go into a community in conflict, we will ask, if it's an ethnic or racial divide, is there anyone across those divides who you trust? If it's a corrupt government, is there one minister who's trying to serve the needs of the people? If it's an out of control military or police force, is there one colonel or a captain or even a beat cop who's built strong relationships with the community? And what we find is when you ask those kinds of questions, those leading positive oriented questions, 100% of the time you get tons of answers, no matter where you are. From the outside, conflict settings look frozen and impossible. From the inside, when you look for those signs of hope, you find them all over the place. So that's the first step of our methodology. Identify those nodes of hope and invest in them. The second step is to then build a network of champions at different levels of society. What's the key um, uh, criteria for this network? First, they have to represent the dividing lines that you're trying to bridge. So again, if you go back to that Chicago example, if you're trying to improve relations between the police and the youth, it would be really helpful if on your team, or at least advising your strategy, 
or some former police officers, former gang members, and others who could say, look, I think this would work. I think that would work. I think if you start there, you'll never get credibility with them. If you work with these people, you have an automatic entree. So a network of champions in any conflict setting is that you take all that hope that you're looking for, and you specifically look for people who represent that across the dividing lines you're trying to bridge, and they become your network of champions. Some of them you hire, some of them you partner with, whatever it might be. And the entire focus of our teams everywhere around the world that they're doing this is to foster cooperation across those dividing lines. That's the number one tactic to eventually transform conflict away from violence towards cooperation. Foster cooperation. Dialogue is great and it's necessary, but it's always insufficient. Dialogue is insufficient. You've got to foster cooperation. So that's why our teams are, they're both equipped with nearly 40 years now of frontline peace building experience, but they're also authorized to invent or adapt those tools to the local context. So what does that look like? Everywhere where we work, if you were to visit any of our teams, we're taking an impact trip to Tunisia in April. Um, people will get to see this work on, on the ground. If you visit, you'll see that our teams are doing very traditional conflict resolution everywhere. We facilitate dialogue and we mediate disputes. But our teams also produce thousands of hours of community theater performances. We put out 400 hours uh, a, a month of uh, original television and radio programming, soap operas, reality TV. Uh, I can't count the number of soccer tournaments that we've started between police and gangs. Um, in really divided communities where there's ongoing violence or a strong thirst for vengeance, sometimes the only cooperation you can generate will seem really silly and irrelevant. What will a soccer tournament do to transform violence, ongoing violence between the police and youth gangs? The cooperation that you can start is just where you start. It's a very dynamic process. We start there. That cooperation leads to dialogue groups. That, those dialogue groups lead to a discussion around maybe a community policing initiative, and eventually you have, as our team did in Nepal, uh, a nationwide community policing policy that didn't exist before those soccer tournaments sort of kicked off that discussion. So the second element of our methodology is to build that network, network of champions and then really authorize them to figure out any which way, use any tool of arts, culture, media, dialogue, whatever, to foster cooperation across those dividing lines, right? And then the third and final element of our methodology um, is all of that cooperation is great, but we're not trying to just improve relations between two people, right, or resolve a specific dispute. The whole idea here is how do you shift entire systems? How do you help a whole society become much less likely to return to violence going forward and much more likely to deal with the inevitable conflicts that come in a really constructive, right, and positive way? Um, and in our experience, there are three ways that change becomes really enduring. Right, when you start cooperation. You can either shift institutional behavior, shift policies in a government, in a ministry. You can drive a shift in social norms, how the vast majority of a population talks about and deals with its differences. Or you can give rise to local markets, supply, demand, and capital, where people actually pay for peace building interventions. So I'll just give you a quick example of each of those, and then we'll come back to the 30,000 foot level on what the relevance is for on, on the, the sort of global order questions. So institutional change, right? Um, in Nepal, I told you about this community policing initiative. That started because um, a little over a decade ago, the police in Nepal and youth gangs were literally fighting in the streets almost every day. And an international organization did a poll of Nepali uh, uh, citizens on their, views, on their views of the police. And not surprisingly, the reviews were really nasty, especially from the younger generation. Everyone under the age of 30 basically detested the police, right? Um, and the organization published this poll. It was very embarrassing to the police force. So the police force said, we don't want to work with any of these international organizations. The head of our programming there, Rajendra Mulmi, who's now our Asia Regional Director, Rajendra was a, a really credible youth leader. And he went in to see the chief of police in Kathmandu. And he was able to finally get a meeting after months of trying. And he said, look, we want to help you solve this problem and improve relations with the community. Uh, we'd like to do another poll, but that might point in directions of, of possible, you know, things that we could do together. But we won't publish the poll results unless you're okay with it. And we'd like you to add to the questions that we're going to ask, if there's anything that you would like asked. So the police chief smelled it over. He said, oh, okay, sure, fine. And they had two questions that they asked. One was to uh, please comment on the, the resources you think the police actually had in your local town. Because there were some towns where they didn't even have a car, they didn't have, and, and the police chief said, look, one of the biggest problems we have is people have totally unrealistic expectations of what we can do. There's so much put on us on the front lines, and we don't have the support to do a lot of the stuff that people think we should do. So I wanna, we wanna get a sense for what people actually think, because we'd like to correct that image. 
Uh, and the second question, which was kind of sweet, is, uh, is there anything you would like to thank the police for? So when we ran the poll, like more than 70% said no, but there was the 30% who said yes, and that was kind of a nice starting point. Um, that poll led to uh, some initial uh, soccer tournaments, literally on the weekend, between the police and the youth groups that were literally fighting during the week and then in these tournaments. And then those soccer tournaments led to mixed teams. And those mixed teams started having dialogue groups after, after each match. And the dialogue groups eventually led, over more than a year, to the idea of community policing and what that could look like and piloting it first in one district of Kathmandu. And that eventually got rolled out. Um, that whole approach to community policing wouldn't have come about without that citizen-led effort. But it only became really real and, and really powerful when the institution of the police force took it on, right? So that's uh, an example of institutionalization. You have social norm change, right? When you're trying to change how a critical mass of the population talks about or deals with its differences. I had the privilege of working in Burundi with uh, the first, you, you might have heard of the genocide in Rwanda in 1994. Um, 800,000 people killed in 100 days and not with weapons of mass destruction. The whole sort of population turned against itself across the Hutu-Tutsi dividing line. Burundi neighbors Rwanda. Burundi has the same exact ethnic um, divide. And the president of Burundi was on the plane, the same plane that the Rwandan president was on that crashed and triggered the Rwandan genocide. So there was a real risk in Burundi of the same thing happening. And our team went in with this appreciative inquiry approach. What, what, are, what, what could be a hopeful signs we could invest in? And what the Burundians came up with with whom they talked was um, radio. Radio was the most powerful thing that you could possibly do here. And in fact, radio was used really powerfully in Rwanda to trigger genocide. What's now called fake news was then propaganda, and it was really used to turn the population against itself, right? Um, they said if you use radio in Burundi for the opposite purposes, it could be really powerful. But you'd have to have a, a Hutu Tutsi mixed team. That's never been done anywhere in the Great Lakes region of Africa, Congo, Rwanda, Burundi. That team started the first multi-ethnic staffed radio. It's called Studio Ajambo. If you look Studio Ajambo up today, there have been a lot of case studies on it. The highest ranking US diplomat on African affairs credited that team with preventing genocide. Uh, that team had an extraordinary impact. And I remember sitting with the five, journal five of the journalists who started the radio studio. It was in 2000. And there was a peace process underway, and it looked like it was about to lead to a peace agreement with these rebel groups. But there was still a lot of tension, and the journalists were saying, you know what? It's really taboo to talk about ethnic identity right now. I mean, there's a peace agreement coming, but people will never talk about being Hutu or Tutsi. Or, uh, but if you talk privately to people, everyone has a story about, I'm only alive because she hid my mother during the worst fighting. Or people who did extraordinary things to help one another or to protect one another during the worst parts of the, of the violent conflict. Um, but it's taboo. So they were trying to figure out. I'll never forget sort of sitting with them. And they were brainstorming. I was just sort of listening and asking questions. And they said, you know what, we, we're going to start a, a, a very simple program. It was a half hour weekly show called Inkingi Ubuntu. So Inkingi Ubuntu means Pillars of Humanity. Um, and the basic idea was just a, a human interest story. We'll tell two stories a week. There'll be true stories. We'll, let, we'll interview people, um, extraordinary stories of people who did a lot to help one another or protect one another during the worst of the fighting. Right? This program totally took off. Once people started hearing the stories broadcast, everybody wanted their story told. Or they wanted to honor somebody else. And we were overwhelmed with requests. Just a year after the program started, we held a major festival in Bujumbura, the capital, in the biggest stadium in the country for the Inkingi, for the Pillars of Humanity. And we had, it was just for the people whose stories had been profiled. We had not just Hutu and Tutsi, young and old, men and women, illiterate farmers, colonels in the military, every walk of life. The president came, celebrated the Inkingi uh, as heroes. That was almost two decades ago. To this day, in Burundi, the word Inkingi, which used to mean just pillar, like pillar of a building, um, now is an honorific. Uh, of, uh, it means it's, it's somebody who's a hero of inter-ethnic solidarity. It's something people really strive for. That show hasn't even aired for more than 17 years now. Uh, and yet, Inkingi in Burundi is just part of the language. Um, and that's the way a lot of times sort of um, uh, media programming, um, uh, theaters, things that you do that affect pop culture can really influence how even a, a large part of the population talks about and deals with its differences. And the third and final way that you drive enduring change is by giving rise to local markets, things that will actually pay for peace building, right? And, and markets have a market forces. They can grow without external support, right, or, or philanthropy. Um, about three months into my taking this job, um, five years ago, we were approached by one of the wealthiest uh, mining companies, gold mining companies in Africa. 
and they were proposing a multi-year partnership with us. Uh, our team had been working with them in Tanzania on and off for four years. Initially, they were called because there had been riots at one of the three mine sites that this company runs, and an overzealous security guard had killed one of the rioters. And this is oftentimes when we get called, sort of when things go really bad, right? Um, but now it was a few years later, and they were proposing this multi-year partnership with us. They'd, until then, they'd just been doing these spot projects. So I flew to London, and I, meet, I met with their CEO. And I said, this is really interesting to us, but why, why now, and what's going on? And he said, you know, we ran an internal review and an assessment, and we found that our use of ammunition, this is mostly crowd dispersal ammunition, like tear gas and rubber bullets and bean bags, our use of ammunition has gone down 98%. And um, our security budget, the, the, what we have to pay for community security, has gone down nearly 60% from 46 million pounds a year to 19 million pounds a year. But our security results are way up. We haven't had any demonstrations at any of the mines, let alone death. Uh, the community now proactively reaches out to us. We have mechanisms for their complaints and shielding. And we credit a lot of that to what your team has done here. So we'd like this multi-year partnership. So um, I actually, not only did we sign that partnership, but just last year I went to the International Conference of Mining and Minerals, all the executives of the mining companies that were there. And I did a little bit of the talking, but the main speakers were executives of some of the companies that we worked with, talking to their fellow executives about the fact that this is not something they support out of charity or out of their corporate social responsibility budget. This comes out of their core security and community relations budget. And that we see as a, a real market. That's different from getting philanthropic support to work in a country or even UN aid to work in a country. Mining companies make 40, 50, 60 year investments and they don't want all that investment to go up in smoke because the pipeline gets bombed by one person you know, uh, or there's a riot. Um, and so pulling all the way back up, our methodology is basically you look for signs of hope and invest in them you build teams that represent the dividing lines that they're trying to bridge, and then you support them to foster cooperation and trust. But all of that cooperation and trust only really triggers enduring change when you're able to trigger either a change in institutional behavior, a change in social norms, or give rise to markets that support peace building. So that's what works on the front lines of peace building. And I'll end with coming back up to the 30,000 foot level. What does that have to do with the world order and what's going on since World War II? So one of the things that's interesting is uh, policymakers uh, are, have definitely recognized that the old system is broken. Uh, and we're seeing all kinds of indications and reactions to this. The, the, in uh, 2000, the UN Security Council resolution passed, res uh, the UN Security Council re passed resolution 1325, calling on states to include women's voices in peace building processes. Pretty basic thing. It still hasn't been implemented particularly well. But the peace processes that include women in decision making roles have a substantially higher percentage of success rates in lasting at least 15 years. Um, in uh, uh, 10 years later, I think it was 2010, or it might have been 2015, uh, UN Security Council Resolution 2250 was passed. This calls on states to open up pathways for young people to play a role and directly participate in peace processes. We've been a, we were a lead drafter of that, um, and, and that we're now coming up with mechanisms whereby states can actually open up these pathways for youth participation in peace process. We're living, we're living at a time right now, if you're just looking at the news, with unprecedented mass demonstrations in almost every region of the world, from Chile to Hong Kong to Lebanon to Guinea, to, um, and many of them are being led either by women or by young people or both. And there's this recognition that you have to bring people of these different demographics who have been traditionally excluded into roles of decision making. Just today, by complete coincidence, uh, the US Congress passed on a bipartisan basis, it still happened, something called the Global Fragility Act. This, is, this will go completely unnoticed in the political reality of the United States right now. But Democrat Senator Coons, Republican Lindsey Graham co-sponsored this along with a number of other sponsors, Republican and Democrat. This is the first major legislation that directs US international aid, not just to dealing with the, the results of violent conflict, the humanitarian aid on the back end, but actually to prevent violent conflict to begin with. What it does is it, it allocates funding to three branches, State Department, USAID, which is the development agency, and the Defense Department. And it says the State Department should be in the lead. That already is revolutionary. Rather than sending money to all three departments, State Department, you're in charge of preventing conflict. We will identify a couple regions. They will do that congressionally, but you know, and you will, be, you will determine how to allocate the resources across these three departments in order to prevent, and we'll come up with common metrics on violence prevention. Um, that just passed. We'll see if President Trump uh, signs it, but that's part of the, what's in the appropriations package that was passed today. That is quite literally revolutionary. Um, uh, even if you look at other things, after the Christchurch massacre, 
the New Zealand Prime Minister Ardern, she co-hosted this summit with social media companies together with, uh, foreign, uh, with Prime Minister Macron of France. Uh, just the spectacle of heads of state meeting with social media company CEOs and CEOs. All that we're seeing is time and time again, governments, multilateral institutions like the UN trying to figure out how can we better connect with citizen peace building, whether it's youth, whether it's engaging women more in decision-making uh, powers, whether it's engaging differently with the social media sector. And so there are a lot of efforts now underway, and our organization and other peers we work with are directly engaged in most of these to reimagine what a much more effective you know, a global order could be. And I'll end with sort of why I'm here to begin with. So um, well, I, I grew up here. Um, I haven't been in this library for I, at least 15 years. Um, um, it's really nice to be back. Um, uh, I, uh, I, I'd like you all to maybe, if you wrote it down, pull out, or if you just remember it, uh, what that phrase was, the thought that you had when I asked you what peace building is. Does anybody remember what it was? Uh, yes, what was yours? Cooperation. Cooperation. Anyone else? Starts with, the, with me. Starts with each person. Anyone else? Negotiation. Negotiation. Very difficult. Very difficult. Amen. Yes. Working together. Equity. Tolerance. Tent. Tent. Not tent. Tents. T n s e. Okay. Well, thank you for that. I mean, this. Yes. Civil discourse. Yeah. Building bridges. So it's right. So I have to say, you're the you're the kindest audience I've done this for in a while. Um, futility. Thank you. Um, so uh, I'm here, and I'm speaking in more and more venues like this. I I recruited a president. I split my job into two a year ago. I recruited a president to lead the organization and run it, and I'm 95% externally facing right now, because at the end of the day, peace building has a severe image problem. Either people don't think of it as a field at all. You know, if I said, hey, I, I, I can't tell you the number of times I said, hey, you know, I work in peace building, people have no clue what I'm talking about. If I say I work in human rights advocacy or environmental protection uh, or humanitarian relief, but you say peace building, I, more, more often than not, people go, what are you talking about? So you either don't think about it, or to the extent that people think about it at all, it has a, people have a really outdated and pejorative notion. It's holding hands and singing songs. It's nice when you can afford it, but it's unrealistic in the real world. Um, and the fact of the matter is that over the last 40 years, the state of the art of peace building practice has evolved well past those stereotypes. The reason that the National Security Advisor of Nigeria is seeking for our help, the reason that the Foreign Minister of Iran and Secretary Kerry at the time publicly thanked our organization for the contributions we made to the Iran nuclear accord, the reason that we're getting demand now from people who we used to have to beg to take us seriously 15 years ago is because there's a recognition at, the, at those policy levels that state-led peace building alone doesn't work, that you need to engage citizen peace building, and that when you do, it actually works. The Rand Corporation did a study. They looked at four kinds of peace building interventions, the ones that were led by the UN, the ones that were led by the US, the ones that were led by the European Union, and the ones that have been led by the African Union. They looked at 26 case studies, and they studied them on two vectors, peace building intervention. Did they create more liberty or democracy, and did they create more stability or peace? A full half of the interventions they found created substantial and sustained gains on one or both of those fronts. And if you look at what was required in order to create it, a lot of what I've talked about today is imbued in those peace building approaches. Yes, sir. So we established an office in Afghanistan last uh, year, uh, and in fact, we just this year we we won the only State Department grant that uh, supports a non-governmental organization to work with the Taliban. Uh, and uh, and you're right. If you if anybody looked at the recent expose in the Washington Post uh, of the last 18 years of war, 
The Afghanistan war is the longest war in US history. Uh, if you look at the metrics of success that policymakers across Republican and Democratic administrations alike set, this is not a partisan issue. If you look at the metrics of success we set ourselves at the government level, um, we're going to reduce opium production. Afghanistan now produces 80% of the world's opium. We're going to reduce deaths of Afghan citizens. Uh, 2018 had the high, uh, 2019 had the highest death rate since the war started 18 years ago. Uh, you basically kind of go at every sort of metric of success and it's on exactly the opposite. And it goes directly to what Chuck Hagel said to me, that you cannot win wars in that way. So how would we engage? Exactly how I just told you that we would engage. And that's how we've done it. We've gone in, and we were just starting. Uh, we've gone in, we've identified where those nodes of, of hope are, how you can get people working across their differences. One thing that I can promise you is not only Afghanistan, but every single conflict that you've read about from the outside looks much more frozen and impossible than it does on the inside. And one of the things that tends to make it much more difficult is a military first solution. It doesn't mean that the military isn't ever needed, but a military first or a military only solution tends to exacerbate these things. So our team is on the ground right now looking for and identifying how can we foster cooperation among the citizens themselves and what kind of future they want to create. I can tell you that when we first went in, the Afghan women's movement is incredibly powerful and forceful. And they demanded, actually, to have a seat at the table in the peace negotiations. The peace negotiations were being facilitated in Doha, Qatar. And they weren't allowed to come. So they literally organized themselves in order to get on a plane and show up at the Taliban offices in Doha. And the Afghan government contacted the Qataris and got the Qataris to deny them visas. Now, what's going on in Afghanistan right now is a vibrant debate, women-led debate around how can you keep us out of this process. And I can tell you, it is not frozen. Our team is directly engaged with leaders of this movement. And our approach is not, you know, there's, I'm going to use a gross analogy. Um, the approach in closed societies, whether you're talking about culturally closed or politically closed, that is oftentimes assumed to work is the adversarial confrontational approach. That approach, in most instances, will get you kicked out, killed, arrested, whatever it might be. Um, if you have heard the analogy of the frog in boiling water, you toss a frog in boiling water, it jumps right out. But if you slowly turn up the heat on a frog in water, it'll sit there until it has its body temperature adjusts, and then it will just die when the water boils, doesn't realize what's happening. It's a gross analogy. A better analogy is, has, does anyone know the, the martial art of Aikido? If, if you watch, so if you watch an Aikido master, and you just go onto YouTube and look up Aikido master, it's the coolest thing. So, and the, the goal of an Aikido master is to get both themselves and their adversaries to a safe space. Again, the goal is to get both themselves and their adversaries to a safe space. So you will never see an Aikido master strike anyone. What you'll see them do masterfully is deflect attacks, roll their opponents, but always make sure that their opponent lands safely, uh, but also stand up for themselves, not allow themselves to get the approach of our teams around the world in closed settings is exactly that. It is a subversive approach. It's not a directly confrontational approach. We worked under Charles Taylor's Liberia for years and years. Um, uh, and um, what you'll see in closed societies is there are always openings that you don't see from the outside. In Charles Taylor's Liberia, you could get away with things in the radio, which was much more powerful than print media. You could get away with things in the radio that you could never get away with in print. Why? Because there was a written record of the print media stuff. So print journalists were always having problems. You could do stuff on the radio. So we started Talking Drum Studio in Liberia. We started a program called Golden Kids News. These are 12-year-old cub reporters. They would get away with going up and asking a question of colonels. We even had an interview with the vice president. They're like, oh, a cute 12-year-old. They would answer questions that no adult journalist could ever get them to answer. It was incredibly powerful. We just gave an award to a guy named Jimmy Sankola, who now the primary investigative journalist in Liberia. He's got a million followers uh, a week on his, uh, the radio show that he hosts. He started out as a Golden Kids news reporter. Now, the key to that approach is that it takes time. It doesn't take forever. I don't, and frankly, if we're going to get involved in an 18-year war, I will actually put up a peace-building approach against that timeline any day. We looked at all the examples where our teams over the last 40 years have been able to trigger the kind of enduring change I talked about, where they either changed an institution, or they changed social norms, or they changed the market, they gave rise to a market. The vast majority of cases, we looked at how long it took. How long did it take Rajendra between walking in and trying to get that chief of police just to take him seriously, 
to, there's a community policing initiative now nationwide that nobody credits us for. They own it themselves, the police. How long did that take? The vast majority of cases, we looked at more than 40 case studies, the vast majority of cases took between eight to 10 years. So it's not short-term stuff, but it's not forever stuff either. And it's, it's interesting because, you know, we're not, we sometimes will get critiqued as not being very theory-based, but we're not, we're very practice-based, but our practical experience completely lines up with the theory. One of the leading theorists of this field is Jean-Paul Lederach, and he says you can't measure results in peace building at any meaningful level in less than 10-year increments. So again, it doesn't mean 100-year increments, but it also doesn't mean you're gonna do a project for two years. So our engagement in Afghanistan will look for signs of hope, build a network of champions, get them cooperating around whatever the heck they can cooperate around, no matter how silly it might seem at first, and over time build the trust that they can start solving their problems together. And you might absolutely need military engagement to prevent the worst of the violent extremists from blowing everything up or whatever it might be, but that's the approach that, that we take. And I'm gonna end with sort of the, the, the I was kind of ending with just kind of why I'm here. I'm now 95% externally facing, and then we're basically looking for uh, three things. Uh, people, platforms, and of course funding. And Maintaining library is not a place for a fundraiser, but you know, I built, I'm building three boards now. I've got my global board, which is headquartered mainly based and meets mainly here in the, in the US. I've got my European board, which meets in Brussels, and, and we've started a UK board, because it seems like UK and Europe might not be the same thing um, <laughs> soon. Um, so we're building boards. I've established a President's Leadership Council that's chaired by Queen Noor for people who, um, you know, who don't have any governance needs or responsibilities, but the only thing I ask them is please answer the phone when I call. I'm going to them for introductions. Um, the second thing we're looking for are venues. Um, we do different formats of engagements. We call them conflict salons, small intimate gatherings, kind of like this. We do master classes where we interview global leaders in peace building and invite a larger audience and live stream them out. Um, we do annual awards event. We do a lot of things. So we're looking for venues to do that. Um, if there are venues here in New Canaan, it's a good excuse to see my mother and friends again. Uh, or in New York City, we do a lot of those. Uh, and finally, on the funding front, we do, we, we we're able to raise funds from governments and multilateral institutions. Our major funders are the European Union, the US government, all of the Scandinavian foreign ministries. Um, but we leverage private philanthropy at a one to 16 rate. The most valuable dollar for us is the dollar that comes from individuals. Um, that's because the way that money is structured from governments is very restricted and doesn't allow for anything like the creativity and strategic approach that, that we do. So that's why I'm here. And so I'm, I'll go back out to the questions and everything right now, but I just wanted to share that before I lost anyone. If anyone's interested in finding out more about the organization or maybe you'd want to host something in your corporate office or your place of worship or even your home with friends, a conflict salon, that kind of, I'm always open for that kind of thing. That's my job now, which is fun. I just get to talk. Anyway, yes? That must have been at least 25 years ago. South African organization? The left is co-founded. And on the left, what is one of the first main actors to revolt? In one way or other, they are still on the same or the left side. Mm -hmm. Revolt to prevent the mm -hmm. So um Yep. 
So on the first, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm going to cut you off because there are other hands up. So on the first question, the 90, the, uh, we've got about 90% of our program teams uh, are uh, uh, local to the countries in which they work. 90% of our global uh, operations are local to the place where they work. Uh, our registration in some places is as the branch of an American organization. In other places, it's as a branch of a European organization. In other places, it's a local entity, uh, local civil society organization. Whatever will work. Um, and sometimes, frankly, the international uh, legal framing is quite helpful to local leaders, and sometimes it's, it's harmful. So our approach is whatever, whatever will work. A South African identity, for instance, would be great in some places. As, you, as I'm sure you know, it would be terrible in other places. So um, um, I think the main point is that the leadership, who makes decisions about what we're going to do and how we're going to do it, has to be local. And in our case, it not only has to be local, but it has to be local and representative of the dividing lines. In, but the other answer to your question goes to the funding. Because the other way you get perceived is who's funding you, right? Um, so on that front, two things. One, we have a more diverse array of funding than any of our organization in, in, in our field um, uh, in terms of the number of governments and multilateral institutions that support us. Uh, we have two criteria for who we'll take money from or not. Uh, one, do they want to influence the work that we're doing in ways that are out of line with our mission? Or two, is the perception of them Fair or not, doesn't matter, is the perception of them, which goes to your point, such that it'll prevent us from working with any key stakeholders to the conflict. And on that basis, you know, there are places where we don't take US government funding. There are other places where we don't take uh, Belgian funding. There, you know, th th that's, that, that we, we have to take that into account. So that's how we operate in terms of perception. But I think if you were to um, check, for instance, in any of the countries where we work, is that an American organization? Is that local? The face of the organization I think there's one, there's one program in the 28 countries that we work, actually there are no, no programs in the 28 countries that we work where the lead uh, person is, is American um, uh, right now. I think your second question though, uh, what was your second question about? Youth, so um, yeah, I feel very strongly about this. So young people are, um, there's been a real interest in youth in the last 10 years and unfortunately that interest is largely, largely the result of uh, violent extremism. Um, and therefore governments have suddenly become very concerned about youth from the perspective of kind of seeing young people as um, potential weapons of mass destruction that at best can be diffused. It's a very cynical and a very patronizing way to approach youth. And yet we know that young people are the main engines, as you're pointing out, to really constructive change in any society. Um, every major social movement that I can think of in this country, abroad, has been largely instigated or led by young people. Oftentimes it's the older folks that get the Nobel Peace Prizes, but it's the young people who start organizing in clubs, on college campuses. Um, people forget that um, Gandhi was 24 when he started the Natal National Congress in, in South Africa. Uh, Martin Luther King was 25, I think, when he launched the Selma bus boycott, 25. Um, Mandela was 26 when he uh, co-established the African National Congress's youth wing. Um, 24, 25, 26, and we're seeing now the youngest ever Nobel Peace Laureate, um, Malala. So, you know, uh, I completely agree with you on the investment in youth. I want to go for so far as to say if you just support young people, everything gets better, but we are very committed. Uh, if, if you track the progress of UN Security Council Resolution 2250, it says you got to involve young people in peace processes. Well, that's fine to say. We did a, a survey for the UN uh, looking at the impact of youth participation in peace processes and the different ways in which they were engaged. It's, it's fantastic and it, it, it kind of, it shatters the stereotype that, no, you have to do peace processes with old guys who sit in the back room and secretly craft a deal and then sell it to the people. That doesn't work anymore. Uh, you've got to find ways to engage other demographics. Uh, and so I'm very much with you on that. We invest a lot in that. We have a dedicated youth, children and youth um, uh, wing whose entire purpose is not just to run our own programs, but to get the international community to invest more in young people, to open up pathways for them. We're, 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 for, we don't, we're, we're for radical youth. We just want that radicalization to be channeled in constructive, nonviolent ways. And our, our belief is that radical young people are the main engines of change throughout history. Yes, sir. Yeah. It's a really good question, and, and it's an age-old question. Like, is there just evil in the world? And, and maybe you just can't deal with it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just escape the question a little bit by just saying to you, um, um, uh, 
I think the, the bigger issue for me right now is that I think we tend to define as being beyond the pale a whole array of actors who actually are not. Uh, I'm not going to say to you I don't think there's evil in the world, but I will absolutely very confidently say to you we paint as evil and unapproachable and unchangeable way more people than actually are. I, this goes in both directions. It's not just around the horrible, you know, somebody goes in and blows up 100 innocent citizens. It also goes in the rise of authoritarianism that you see around the world. Um, two quick anecdotes on this. We, and, and our teams have had, quite literally, I can tell you stories of uh, uh, warlords who have broken down crying <laughs> at the result of a process and engagement with some of the families of their victims. I, you know, um, there are rapacious leaders, obviously, but what we see a lot of is leaders who are struggling with the dynamics I just talked about. And you know, going back to youth, behind closed doors, you will get an acknowledgement that they're basically scared of their own youth populations. Or they don't know how to deal with uh, a, a, an extremist group that sinks back into the population, is hard to identify and target that. Every time you try to target them, you create more enemies among the population, they recruit more of them. And so what uh, military leaders often, and national security people often do, a lot of them don't have a lot of creativity. A lot of them don't have relationships with conservative religious leaders or youth leaders or people who could be helpful if they were sitting on the same side of the table. And when they don't know what to do, they tend to revert to what they do know, which tends to be top-down, security first, don't allow them to come together. Um, the number of times when a policy approach has really given truth to the phrase, the cure is worse than the disease, when it comes to violent extremism is, is it's, it's in, in numerous. I was in Niger um, just last year. There were no motor scooters in the streets. There are motor scooters everywhere in that region. It was so visible. There were no, why were there no motor scooters? Because the, uh, the local di directorate in Difa, Niger, had outlawed motor scooters because a lot of extremist groups uh, had used them to do drive-by shootings. They're devastating the local economy. Literally, you can't, the people can't get around without their motor scooters. In Lamu, Kenya, this is a, a you know, last story on this. Um, I, I have a colleague named Judy Komomo. Um, Judy runs our programming in Kenya. In Kenya, uh, the government was trying to deal with the insurgents from Al-Shabaab, uh, you know, from Somalia. And the way that the Al-Shabaab insurgents would come into Kenya, and they blew up hospitals, I mean, uh, blew up uh, hotels, and they've been devastating the, the country. They come in through the sea, and they disguise themselves as fishermen, and they come into Kenya, and then they do whatever they're going to do, and then they drift away again. In 2011, I think it was, the Kenyan government outlawed night fishing along the, the coast, the Lamu coast. They outlawed night fishing. That is a direct threat to the livelihood of that entire region. Now, Judy is less powerful than probably every single person in this room. She's got no particular standing. She's a woman in a particular district that's fairly patriarchal. And what Judy did, she literally started talking to the fishermen and the 12 different security agencies and the youth group, eventually was able to bring them together for discussions. Fast forward, uh, they came up with the idea of having um, electronic scan cards. They call them Mavuvi cards, right? So if you're a fisherman now in Lamu uh, District, you have to register and get a Mavuvi card. If you have a Mavuvi card, then anybody, any security person can scan your card and, and see that you're legit. In 2017, six years after the ban, because of that intervention, they opened night fishing again. Judy, I think, is single-handedly responsible for reviving the economy in that region. So on to your question about evil, I choose to not speak about whether it's definitely out there or not. Well, I'm much more focused on the fact that the, 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 this, the things that we assume are done strictly out of a dictatorial mindset or the people who are completely beyond the pale, we tend to draw that line a lot closer to our own identities than is really the case. And there are organizations already who are out there banging the, you know, the human rights advocacy against uh, violence. We stand very firmly for, um, we will talk with anyone. Uh, we will talk with anyone. And a part of talking to anyone is, is starts with listening to them and trying to find out what's really motivating them. And what we found when you do that is a lot fewer people are evil than, than people think. Yeah. Somebody always does that to me, and I'm, I'm always trying to escape that one, too. Um, this is going to sound like a cop-out, okay? Um, but I really think it's going to be one or the other. I don't think we're going to land in between. If you look at previous pieces of times in history where one world order, you, you look at previous times where there's been relative peace for decades, after the Congress of Europe, 
after the Treaty of Versailles, if you look at when those periods came to an end, uh, they tend to give rise to pretty cataclysmic violence. You know, basically to see who the winners are, they get to draw the rules of the new world order, just like happened with World War II, and we got a UN Security Council, a UN Security Council, the permanent members of which won World War II. Does it make any sense that the UK, sorry, UK, but the UK and France are UN Security Council members, but Brazil is not even considered, or India is not even considered, or I mean, major population centers, major economic powers, et cetera. Um, so I think we're at this phase right now where one world order is teetering, if not collapsing. And what's gonna come next isn't yet defined. And one of the reasons that, frankly, I'm so passionate about the work that we're doing is I do think we have the capacity to accelerate and give rise to that new world order without having to go through cataclysmic violence. But I think it's gonna be one or the other. We're either gonna figure that out, or with all the weapons of destruction we have now, which are, every time this happens, the weapons of destruction are worse, um, we're gonna have a, a really devastating conflict in, the, in this century. Yeah. When we were started, uh, so the, the, our founding story, we were founded by, um, so how are we doing on time? I just wanna be respectful of your time. Oh, we have 20 more minutes. Feel free to walk out. I mean, I, 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 I'll, um, um, so when we were started, we were started by a guy named John Marks. John was the founder of the organization. I succeeded John as the president, so he ran the organization for almost 35 years. John was a foreign service officer in Vietnam. He was an American foreign service officer. He quit the foreign service in protest to the Vietnam War. And he joined the staff of the senator, the Republican senator, uh, Senator Case, who wrote the legislation that cut the funding for the war, which as you know is what ended the American involvement in Vietnam as Congress stopped paying for it. And then John went on to a very successful career as an investigative journalist. He wrote the, two of the first exposés, both bestsellers, two of the first exposés of the CIA. Got him in a lot of trouble. He had a case that went all the way to the Supreme Court. He lost. So, so John was becoming um, somewhat of a kind of, if not a cult figure, a, a known figure in the whole kind of anti-establishment, anti-war movement of the late 60s and 70s. And in the late 70s, uh, and I'm telling this story because I think that was the last era of great polarization in this country, and that was the last era also of political violence in this country, assassinations and those kind of things. And, and John had a, an epiphany that he still talks about to this day, that his entire life was oriented around adversarial advocacy. He was spending all of his time trying to tear down the old system and rail against the bad guys, and none of his time trying to build the new system. And they're not the same thing. And his whole idea in founding Search for Common Ground was, not that he doesn't feel strongly about things, but rather than establish an organization that would pick one side and go to war with the other, literally or figuratively, he wanted to establish a place that would bring the different sides together, and not for some watered down, lowest common denominator solutions that really aren't very meaningful. But rather, the core idea was, if you had the right kind of process and trust building, you might be able to generate highest common denominator solutions that nobody would have thought possible if they just stayed in their different camps. Republican, Democrat, whatever it might be. And the core idea there is that conflict, yes, can lead to polarization or violence, but conflict can also be the best force in the world, the most generative force of creative solutions. So when we were established, the idea was we would be 50% domestic and 50% international, and we were until 1995. This organization was doing work. We did, you can look at grainy PBS, um, a, a series called Common Ground America, which was basically John doing on-air mediations. He had the head of handgun control and the head of, um, uh, the NRA, which even then was Wayne LaPierre. I think he's been head of the NRA forever. Um, and the idea wasn't, oh, let's all just get along. It was really, really practical and specific. Let's really define and narrowly define. Let's not have a, where you really disagree and you probably think you're not always gonna disagree. Let's see if there are any places where you might agree. And they would come up with things like, yeah, anybody who gets a gun should get trained. Yeah, it's okay if the NRA runs the training, but getting people trained would mean that they're less likely to have accidental deaths. There are a lot of accidental deaths, you know, et cetera, stuff like that. So the organization was doing that for all those years. 94, 95 came and we started establishing offices overseas. We established that office in Burundi right after the genocide. We established an office in Macedonia during the Balkans conflict. And we started establishing a track record of being able to have some positive impact on these conflicts. And we got a lot more demand from UN agencies and others. And so really for no strategic reasons, the organization started skewing. About 95% of our work became international. I came in and succeeded John five years ago. Um, I've been wanting to do something in this country, but wanting to do it in a way that could be sustainable at scale. I think it's a lot easier to erode norms of civil discourse than to build them back up. And so I think the only thing that will work in this country is an approach that can be sustained at scale for 10 to 20 years. Um, and so we've been looking at what could that be, and what we've come up with is called First Year Connect. Um, 
and I won't go into a lot of depth on this. If anyone's interested in afterwards, I'll tell you. But uh, college campuses are one of the main ground zeros of the polarization in this country. The Unite the Right demonstration uh, that started where that counter protester was killed uh, started on the UVA campus. My wife's a professor. The FBI was on her campus for two weeks because somebody hung bananas off of nooses when the first African American student class president was elected. Uh, campuses are really struggling to deal with the polarization um, of this country. Um, and for a lot of Americans, the college campus is the most diverse place they've ever been by the, when they arrive, racially, politically, whatever it might, might, might be. And I started talking to university presidents and trustees and others, and what we found is they have no idea how to deal with this issue. And when you ask, well, how do you form community and try to break through these dividing lines now? When the, since the most ubiquitous project, the thing that, that is done by more campuses than any other, is the common book. I don't know if anyone remember. When I went to Swarthmore, we got the common book. So you graduate high school, and everyone who gets into Duke or wherever, they all get the same book. And they're told, read this in the summer. You, know, you got everybody read The Catcher in the Rye or whatever. And then when you come on campus, we'll have dialogue groups. We have not, somebody started this like 40 years ago, literally. And now over 1,000 campuses do this. We haven't talked to a single person who thinks it works particularly well. Half the kids don't read the book. In today's era, even the choice of book is incredibly polarizing. Um, and and uh, students tend to self-segregate before they even get onto campus because of social, social media now. So you're finding kids that come onto campus, they're already starting to kind of get balkanized in this way. So we took a, a technology and a platform that we've been using internationally to foster what we call virtual exchanges. These are online, small group, intensive dialogue sessions, highly professionally facilitated of eight groups in, of, of eight to 12. And we're saying to campuses, look, Turn over your entire incoming class to us every year. You determine what the dividing lines are that you're really struggling with. Religious, political, racial, socioeconomic, sexual orientation, whatever they are, and let's form uh, eight to 12 group member dialogue groups that have that kind of diversity. Before they ever come into campus, we'll have four sessions with them in this online platform, highly facilitated, and we're pretty confident, based on almost 20 years of running this program internationally, that by the time they get onto campus, you're going to have a much more cohesive student body. And a third of the kids who go through the international program get inspired by the facilitators. A lot of them have never been part. They're used to a very didactic instruction. To have somebody that's actually enabling them to have a difficult conversation well, a lot of them haven't done that. So a third of the kids who go through the international program volunteer to become facilitators. We run a 25-hour really intensive facilitation training online, all on the platform. So what we're saying to campuses is, turn over your entire incoming class. We will deliver to you. Uh, much more cohesive student body, and a third of the alumni from that will become facilitators. So that by year four of the program, your seniors and your juniors will be facilitating uh, the introductory experience of the first year students on the very subjects of race, class, politics, the things that are so divisive. Um, and the whole idea here is that, uh, you know, we're going to start it with philanthropic, a philanthropic subsidy, two years, where we'll cover some of the costs just to prove ourselves. But the campuses that are going to do this with us are signing agreements that say, if we hit the metrics, of social cohesion and skill building, year three they're going to take it over. So my dream would be that in 10 years, you know, this would become the new common book. That you would have hundreds of thousands, if not a million Americans, every year at that impressionable age, going through a transformative cross-cultural experience, and a third of them, 300,000 maybe a year, becoming highly trained facilitators. And I think that done over 20 years is the kind of thing that might stand a shot, might <laughs> stand a shot to really reverse the, the culture of discourse. I don't think it's, there's just no quick fix for what's going on right now here. And a lot of the dynamics that we see in violent conflict settings are very, are, are, have manifested really clearly here. So I'm very concerned about this country. That's not the best way to end this, but <laughs> so, um, thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks to the library.